Transmetti, I think we are going live. Yes, we are live now. Hello, I warmly welcome you to our fifth, in the meanwhile, 59th webinar by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. On this uh, 18th of March, I'm really delighted that you have come to join us. And um, I'm really curious uh, to learn more about and Today's topic, and um, my name is Sabina Heinz. I'm the person responsible for our webinar series and one of the vice presidents at uh, SRI, and also responsible for our art chapter because I'm an artist. And uh, our today's special guest is Dr. Armin Pepeshin, and I'm really uh, yeah, delighted you have come to join us. It's a pleasure to, to have you here. Hello, Armin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, for inviting me. Yeah, it's a pleasure for us to, to have you here. Uh, Dr. Armin Papeshin will talk about the monetary foundations of spacefaring spaces. I also would like to welcome uh, Bern, um, Adriano Ottino. Uh, he is vice president and former president of Space Renaissance International and one of the founders of SRI. Hello, Adriano. Hi, Sabine. Hi, Armin. Very, very happy to have you here and to listen to your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Adriano mentioned that we already have seven, 700 subscribers to our YouTube channel. So uh, split this information and uh, it would be very nice to have more subscribers that we can enlarge our community and uh, spread this, all this information, uh, our webinar uh, to as many people as possible. I also would like to welcome our audience and we have uh, people watching from Norway, uh, from Holland, uh, we have people watching from Florida near the uh, Kennedy Space Center, uh, from the Planet Reunion, from Dublin, Ireland, and also from Portugal. <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy that you all have come to join us. And uh, before I give you the floor, um, I, mean, I would like to introduce you to our audience. Um, Dr. Armin Papeshin is the author of Hardwiring Sustainable Sustain oh, gosh, sorry, Sustain Sustainability into Financial Mathematics and the Space Value of Money, Rethinking Finance Beyond Risk and Time, and a founder and director of the Space Value Foundation, an, advo an advocacy platform that campaigns campaigns the embed uh, sustainability into the very core equations of finance. He is a financial economist, author, consultant, and innovator with a track record in global finance and more than 20 years experience in sustainable finance, capital markets, and analytics. Armin is a doctor of financial economics from Cambridge University a thinker and practitioner who brings extensive advisory experience for financial institutions and markets with research into both the academic and practical aspects of uh, sustainable finance challenges. Amen, the stage is yours. And sorry for <laughs> my mistake. Uh, you may share the screen if you like. No worries. Thank you, Adriano. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, and I will definitely share my screen right away and I'll jump uh, into the presentation straight away. You can see my screen. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. Very well. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, thank you, all of you watching today, or all of you that who will watch this presentation someday in the future. Um, I'm very well aware that the audience is quite diverse. Um, some of you are in the space industry. Some of you, as Sabid mentioned, may be physicists, or and some of you may be already involved in finance. So my purpose is to be as straightforward and as 
uh, using a very uh, simple language in order to explain some of the technical bits that relate to specifically to finance. Uh, but mainly, I'm going to have a conversation with you uh, and share um, my ideas and the, the research and the insights that I have, uh, I've been writing and talking about uh, over the last few years. So before I jump into the core content, I believe we must um, contextualize ourselves and our minds. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, this is an actual image, photo of the Milky Way. This is not an AI generated image. I will be using quite a bit of AI generated images in this presentation to make sure that the content is as entertaining as possible. Uh, but this is an actual photo of the Milky Way. It's actually an award-winning photograph taken by Lorenzo Ramieri Tenti, and it's called Rising from the Dust. Now, why do I believe that this is important? Because first of all, if we are going to align our minds and have a conversation that we're with an optimal outcome, I believe this is an important starting point. We have to contextualize our minds. Now, this is where we are. Now, you're looking at your screen. You can see the Milky Way. Now, if I were to tell you, look at the stars, you probably will look up. But I would like you to note, and I'd like your mind's eye to recognize that the stars and the image that you see in front of you is not just above up there. It's also underneath your feet. The Milky Way, the stars are not just above our heads. They're also underneath our feet. And I would like you to remember this fact as I go through this presentation. Now, we are 8 billion of us now, humans. Now, this entity that we call the species is, is a very diverse mosaic uh, with many languages. In fact, you wouldn't find two individuals alive today, or actually, even if you took into account all those who are dead, you wouldn't find two individuals that have read the same books, have, the, have read the same articles, even if they had the same background and they graduated the same schools. Our minds are built uh, with a very diverse set of inputs and exposure. Now, this mosaic that we're in, in stars, sandwiched between stars, above and below, um, it's a reality that we wake up in every day. Um, and uh, whether we're conscious of it or not, whether we allow our minds to accept that as a starting point of our days or not, uh, thus this is where we wake up. Now, where we also are at the moment is, well, the countries, the map, the continents, and the, 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 another layer of our understanding of where we stand um, is the political map. In fact, all of you watching today are somewhere in one of those colorful little pieces on the map. Now, this reality is has evolved over many decades, centuries. Uh, in fact, if you were to look at the many different um, uh, waves of expansion across continents. I mean, the entire map has evolved over thousands of years. Um, now, this is the one we've had recently, but it's still in debate. Um, people debate whether where borders should be and who should rule who and who. how do you select who runs who and how within each of these little colorful pieces. 
Now I'll come back to the map at a later stage in the presentation. But you have, we have to recognize that this is where we are, but this is a human projection to the context that we started with. In fact, this picture, the Earthrise picture that was taken in 1968 is just 55 years old. If you compare the hundreds and thousands of years of on-surface evolution that has given birth to the political map and the many conflicts in it, this interpret this reality, the, the harmonious unified planet um, where there are no borders uh, is a, is a, in color is a, is a very recent phenomenon. Um, and so therefore our understanding of where we are is evolving rapidly, um, but it's still the very beginning of this entire process. Now, Eight billion of us, we're just right there, right now. But not all of us. There's actually a handful of humans now who live in the International Space Station and the Chinese Space Station. Now, if you're used to one sunrise and one sunset per day, on the ISS, they experience 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. Now, this is another contextual reality. So our minds are aligned. Now, I'm not, of course, there are many aspects of the how we interpret this reality uh, that we're in. Um, but I'm going to focus on the monetary aspect of our experience, the, the human experience on this planet. Now, Money itself is created by cotton and linen. Now, polymer, at least depends where you are and what type of, on the political map and who's, who's printing the currency of the country you're in, or the digital version of the same. Um, now, the topic of my presentation is that I'm going to discuss the monetary and financial foundations necessary to enable sustainable outer space development, exploration, and settlement for a species in space that uses money and monetary incentives to drive and direct its own creativity and productivity. Why is this important? Because there could be other species or we even humans could one day evolve to a point where decide that they're going to structure and incentivize human productivity without money. That may be possible. But as of today, on the planet we live in, in 2024, money plays a central function in the way we structure our creativity and productivity on a planetary level. Now, what I'm talking about, of course, is this. Now, this is an AI-generated image, so actual. What would it take? What type of monetary and financial um, transformations and foundations do we need as a species to be able to get to this point of evolution? Now, obviously, many of you may ask, I, you may say, I mean, how are we going to get there? Or more, rather, why do you want to spend or invest in outer space when there's so much pain on this planet? So much poverty, so much injustice, uh, climate change, ecological collapse, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Why? Why would you want to spend and go out to the moon or Mars or wherever you may think we should go? Well, I hope that at the end of this presentation and this lecture, you're going to realize that these two are intricately related. Our inability to invest in and expand in outer space is intricately linked to our inability to create a fair, just, and 
um, uh, and a sustainable reality on Earth. And I hope that you'll be convinced once I'm done with my presentation that in, in truth, these are the two sides of the same coin. They are both our inability to invest into and go into our outer space and our inability to invest um, with the right amount of justice and fairness and respect for our planet. They're linked. Now, let's start at the beginning. We're talking about outer space, so let's talk about orbital launches. In fact, January 2024 was a record month in terms of launches, orbital launches to space, outer space. We had 22 launches, and the Space Foundation describes January 2024 the busiest start to a year since the space age dawned in 1957. Now, this is fantastic, but that's 22 launches per month we're talking about. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of videos which will describe and reveal to you human movement across terrestrial space. This is the first. Now, the flow and the ease with which this happens, just keep it in mind. And this one. And then this one. And finally, this one. Now, the flow of humans across all these different contexts is very different from 22 launches a month. I mean, it's, we're talking about a very different scale of human movement across space. And to achieve this, we need an entire transformed framework. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, to understand where we are and why is it not possible today, despite the and in spite of the great successes achieved by SpaceX and, uh, and NASA and, and the programs and, uh, and the great visions, the fact is that as of 2023, the global budgets or governmental budgets for um, uh, on space programs and agencies was $117 billion. Now, if you were to compare that figure to the global toilet paper market revenues, it barely surpasses that market. Now, why this selection? I mean, the reason I chose this because I wanted to contextualize the level of public governmental expenditure globally. Oh, this, con this includes all the space agencies, space programs. Now, why is this important? Because, well, the public space expenditure is very critical uh, because it is that expenditure which does not expect a monetary return. And that's an important element. Now, let's look at the private space, uh, sorry, and this is the NASA budget. Uh, in fact, if you can, you can see the, the, the level that is relatively stagnant, and if you were to take into account inflation and so on and so forth, I'll come back to this, but it shows and reveals to you the level of funding, public funding in, uh, in uh, space programs. Now, the private space economy, let's look, have a look at that. According to the Space Foundation, again, in the second quarter of 2023, um, the revenues of the private space economy were $427.6 billion. Estimated to grow to 1 trillion. This is a study by Morgan Stanley done in 2020. It's quite 
uh, accurate uh, in broad terms, and that's why I'm using this chart. Um, but there are other sources which project a much uh, a one trillion economy in 2030. So it depends on how and what people take into account. Interestingly, in 2023, the global revenues of the advertising industry were 874.47 billion. So from a planetary level, the species spends a lot more on trying to sell goods and services to itself than on the outer space economy where we are planning on going to different planets and so on. So you can see that the, however positive the expectations and the momentum and the achievements, uh, we are very far from the position where, um, I mean, the relative performance of the sector um, is still modest. Now, outer space economy, based on a, a Bureau of Economic Analysis in the US, actually includes many different industries and, um, and uh, products and services. For example, public and private goods and services that are used in space or directly support those used in space, require direct input from space to function or directly support those that do, are associated with studying space. So the sector is very broadly defined. Now, let me compare those figures to economic figures. Now, if you put together the public and private sector, or private space, outer space economy, uh, let's assume the 2023 figure is a full year figure. I mean, you can, you'll can you see in the next example that it doesn't really matter. So the 117 billion that's spent by public institutions, governments, and the 427 private revenues of the sector, that comes up to around $544.6 billion. Now, if you were to compare that to global wealth, this is the global wealth report that used to be published by Credit Suisse, uh, and now it's UBS, as you may have heard already. Now, if you, the global wealth in 2022 was 454,385 4, billion, that's 454 trillion. That means that the combined public private outer space economy amounts to 0.12% of global wealth, not 12%. 0.12%. Now, if we were to double that figure, let's say a that's almost a trillion, 1,089 billion, that amounts to 0.24%. Now, if you were to compare this figure to global GDP, because global GDP is different from global wealth, obviously, so the global GDP in 2023 was 104 trillion or 104,476 billion. So in other words, we're talking 0.52%. Again, tiny compared to global GDP. Now, if we were planning on building uh, the species, uh, the footprint of the species in outer space uh, and actually achieve we are not at the level where we can achieve that type of an evolutionary step. Now, what's my the key proposition that I make and I'm making today as well as in the paper that you may have seen and is also available on the Space Value, uh, Space Value Foundation website. The key proposition that I'm making is that the suboptimal and inappropriate levels of funding and investment allocated to outer space are directly caused and linked to our financial value framework, to our financial mathematics, and monetary architecture. Actually, some of these arguments I've made in my first book published in 2022, as well as my second book published in 2023, both available on Amazon. Now, what is my argument? Let, let me first define space and outer space. I think this is fundamental. 
um, because sometimes people refer to space as if they're talking about, but but they're actually talking about outer space. Um, in my understanding of our physical context, um, outer space is only a section, a segment, a layer of, of space. Well, because obviously we are in space, right? Uh, you may define space beyond the planet's atmosphere, but that doesn't mean actually that we're not in it. We're obviously in space. So I define space as our physical context of matter that stretches from subatomic space to interstellar space and every layer in between and beyond, where outer space is but a layer. It's a very vast layer, but it's a layer. Now, this is very important. I mean, of course, you can see the layers that I define from subatomic space to the nano world to micro world. And then the colored section is basically the inner core of the, um, the planet, the crust, the oce oceanic crust, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere up to the exosphere, and then moon, solar system, interstellar space. I mean, you can stretch on both uh, in infinitely. Um, you can add many more layers, but these are the layers that we, as humanity, with our as as with our technologies, we've come to interact with these layers. We can also add data sphere. Uh, in fact, I'm working on an uh, an adjustment to the conceptualization, uh, which will potentially I'll be publishing that in the in a later publication. But for now, space is a our physical context of matter that stretches from subatomic to interstellar space and outer space is a segment of this physical context. Now, it's very important for me to discuss the, the boundaries, these layers. Um, yes, I've defined these layers of space, but these are conceptualizations. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean, where does outer space begin exactly? Well, we know that the atmosphere loses density at the edge of the exosphere gradually. There's no point in hard line where the exosphere ends. Now, in fact, there is a line, a conceptual line, a theoretical line, which we call the Karman line, which puts the beginning of outer space at 100 kilometers above sea level, 62 miles. Now, this was actually coined by Andrew Haley, uh, an American lawyer, who, based on the work done by Theodore von Karman, who work, who used to work, who's work, based, inspired by his work on defining the boundary between aeronautics and astronautics. I'm not going to go into that. But the key point is that the Karman line that defines the beginning of outer space is a conceptual line. It's a theoretical line. It does not actually exist in real terms. It defines the end of national airspace and the beginning of outer space. But that's not the only conceptual and theoretical line. Our lives are full of these imaginary lines that define and allow us to make sense of our context of matter that stretches from subatomic to interstellar space. Now, this, the other line, another imaginary line, is the prime meridian. The prime meridian is the line, the point and the line where the the longitude is set at zero degrees. Um, so it passes from Greenwich. It was, the. this is how we have mapped um, our planet. And it, it was used until 1984. Then it was replaced by the International Reference Meridian. Basically, you wouldn't have been able to get on this call if it wasn't for the prime meridian. Because your time zones, your clocks, your... Um, uh, they're all already programmed. That's how we function. This is how we make sense of the terrestrial space. 
Does this grid actually exist? No. It's a theoretical projection onto our physical context. So it's an imaginary point in line. It's a conceptual point that allows us to, to navigate our, our space and our time. Yet more imaginary lines there are electron orbitals. We draw atoms like these beautiful structures, but as you may have already come to learn based on the quantum theory, that these theoretical lines where electrons are orbiting the, the nucleus of the, um, uh, of the atom, they're actually not lines. They're probability clouds. It's basically where an electron is most could has a high probability of being there. Now, why am I digging into this? Because I want you to understand that as although I propose this uh, this layered conceptualization of space, we have to be aware that this conceptualization is a projection as well. These layers are conceptual layers. Otherwise, our physical reality from subatomic space to interstellar, interstellar space is far more malleable than we actually uh, want to believe or we our, our lines and our rules um, uh, reveal or, or, uh, or leave the impression that they're not, but the, they are, the, it is. Space is far more malleable than our imaginary lines um, uh, imply. Now, another thing about these space layers, as humans, we don't all have the, the same space horizon. Just the way we all think differently about the future. Some of us think one day ahead, a week ahead, a year ahead, a few a decade ahead. Also in terms of space, we have a very different space horizon. Every one of us right now is on the continental crust. Unless, of course, one of you is on the ISS, which I'm not sure, I doubt. But all of us are on the continental crust somewhere. But this, the, the continuum of space from the subatomic to interstellar space is available to each and every one of us at any from any point of matter. And yet, the political map is a very narrow bandwidth. It is a very surface reality. Across this immense continuum of space, uh, it's a flat, uh, it's an interpretation, it's a human interpretation, but it is very narrow in its, in its uh, bandwidth in terms of space. Let me give you an example. Now, you noticed earlier on that I said that the Karman line is 100 kilometer above sea level. And the average crust, the, the depth of the uh, continental crust is around 40 kilometers. So this entire, obviously you can't dig deeper, right? I mean, lava is everywhere underneath. Uh, um, the, the in, so this entire interpretation of human existence um, from the edge of national airspace to the bottom of the continental crust where lava begins and no one wants to own that. Um, it's a 140 kilometer segment in this incredibly immense landscape. Now, the distance between Houston and Dallas is 363 kilometers. Imagine, contextualize, our own interpretation, our own space horizon is critical. Many of us on this planet live and define themselves by this map. Their identity is interpreted based on where they're born or, or where they live or, or other sense of belonging. All respectable, no issue. But we have to come to the realization as a species that this is a very narrow bandwidth in the very large continuum of space. Now, 
human impact on this context, on the physical context of matter? Well, this is where, unfortunately, it's quite disappointing. First, you've all heard about climate change, CO2 in our atmosphere, um, uh, heat waves, uh, uh, fires, uh, floods, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the evidence is overwhelming, right? And that's why the Paris Agreement was enacted. It came into force in 2016 to reduce GHG emissions, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. And yet, since 2016, this is the picture. Nothing has changed. Not only nothing has changed. Plus, in 2022, it was the record year for fossil fuel subsidies. They got $7 trillion. And again, in 2023, the UK government gave away hundreds of licenses for new explorations in the North Sea. So basically, we're not going anywhere. We're ruining the atmosphere relentlessly. Now, how about plastic in our oceans? As of today, it's estimated that there are 50 to 75 trillion pieces of plastics and plastic and microplastics in the oceans. Can you guess how many stars there are in the Milky Way galaxy? 100 billion stars. Now, minute compared to the amount of plastic we've dumped in our own oceans. In fact, we leak 11 million metric tons. And if we don't do anything about it, we're going to end up leaking 29 million metric tons of plastic by 2040. And there is no evidence of any kind of change. Debris in orbit. We're very proud of our achievements in space, and we should be. But we have to realize that as of today, we have 36,500 space debris orbiting the planet greater than 10 centimeters and 130 million debris between one millimeter and one centimeter. NASA estimates that we're talking about greater than 9,000 metric tons. Visually, this was the planet in 1960 before we started, and this is in 2019. Basically, what we're doing is we're ruining, littering every space layer we touch, from outer space to atmosphere to hydrosphere to continental crust. And I can give you examples on chemical waste, deforestation, solid uh, municipal waste, it's horrendous. Now, human productivity is evidently oblivious to what it does to space, what it leaves behind, and how it endangers its own continuity, its own evolutionary continuity. Basically, a hit and run civilization. We are littering every space layer we touch. We do not respect space and its many layers. We do not value space and its many layers. In fact, we're consuming our only home ruthlessly, relentlessly. And this is another AI-generated image for you to visualize human civilization at this moment. Now, my argument is that this reality is directly caused by our financial value framework, by our financial mathematics, and our monetary architecture. And for those who may already know about ESG, um, these are these current sustainability frameworks and standards. They're a distraction. They don't do anything. They don't stop what they're supposed to stop. So just as a parenthesis, I'm not going to discuss them here. I just wanted to mention. Now, why is it that all this disrespect of space, the, the, the non-valuation 
Why do we not respect and value space? Well, because our entire financial mathematics, and don't be scared from these equations, they're actually blind, they're useless in, in the context that I described to you. Um, and their sophistication is a smokescreen. Um, and I'll explore this later on. So the key issue with our financial mathematics is that they actually, this is where the root cause of our current issue is. This is where we are going wrong. Well, the issue, and these are some more equations, asset pricing, uh, company valuation, stock valuation, bond valuation, cash flow valuation, option valuation, they're all, there is absolutely no context parameter. They are entirely built on the risk parameters and time parameters. There is no space. Our entire financial mathematics does not consider context parameters. They're irrelevant. Space impact are on our physical context is excluded from our equations. And I'm going to say this because I must. You can show this to any finance expert, any high top level financial academic from the, from the schools that impress you the most. And I'm happy to debate them. So we have a financial mathematics that ignores space, space impact, and is built entirely on risk and time. Now this risk and time focus is caused and is mirrored by the principles that govern the mathematics. You don't have to go into the equations. The principles, the first one is time value of money, which basically is a very simple statement. It says a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow because a dollar today can be invested and can earn a return and can become more than one dollar by tomorrow. Very simple. The other principle that governs that mathematics you just saw is that the higher the risk, which is called risk and return, it says the higher the risk, the higher the expected return. And this is because investors are risk averse, so they don't like risk, and they should be compensated, compensated for any additional risk that they take. The expectations, they expect more reward. Now, these two principles govern the entire analytical framework of finance theory, financial models, equations, and we're or in textbooks or in industry. Now, my argument, one of my arguments is that these two principles, they actually work against our evolutionary investments. They discriminate against human evolutionary investments. Why? Well, because based on these two principles, high risks and very far distant cash flows are negatively priced because of the principles, right? If a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow, now how about a dollar in 50 years? How much less is it going to be worth? And if it's more risky than even... so. You see the logic, but all our evolutionary investments involve very distant returns. And that's how our financial value framework, the principles and the mathematics discriminate against human evolutionary investments. Now, not only they discriminate because of high risks, um, because high risks and distant cash flows are negatively priced. But previously, as I mentioned to you in the previous slide, 
they also omit space impact. So not only space impact is irrelevant, plus cash flows that are distant aren't valuable. And if they're risky, they require higher expectations of reward, which makes them almost impossible to finance. Now, space exploration is an evolutionary challenge. And it is extremely risky. And it involves very distant returns. And it's abundant in space impact. Interestingly, space impact doesn't count in our financial mathematics. And the first two, high, high risks and distant returns, make it so that these are evolution, such pro projects are discriminated against structurally. Now, I have here an example of one basic equation. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, because it's very simple and it's actually um, very myopic in its in its structure and in everything. But just to show you what I mean, this is how the risk and time value of money, as described earlier, is assessed. Future cash flows are brought to the present using a percentage, a discount rate, that's what it's called, the R. Basically, you're trying to measure uh, the value of the future cash flows today, taking those two principles into account. But look, the initial investment is not treated mathematically. So the impact of the investment is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is that it outflow for the mortal risk averse return maximizing investor. Well, look at the imaginary future the non-actual cash flows that the investor is going to receive in the future are far more, uh, they're treated more, I mean, it's not really, it's a relative sophistication, but they're much more, uh, they, 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 the focus is on the imaginary future cash flows rather than the actual impact of the investment. And no context, no space impact, focused on the future expected cash flows. My argument, therefore, is that our financial value framework and our financial mathematics omits, is missing an entire dimension of analysis, our physical context of matter, space, where outer space is. Now, can you be surprised with the reality or the conditions of the world? Our financial mathematics is in this stage. Our financial value framework is blind to space. The stars above your head and underneath your feet don't count in our, in our structures of value in finance, the frameworks of value. So I wish the story ended here, but it doesn't. Now, we also have a spaceless monetary architecture. What do I mean by that? Monetary architecture is basically the way we create money. The previous examples, the framework, the space, uh, the financial value framework, financial mathematics is used to assess investments. This is about how money is created. How is it deployed into our current economies, into in the current economic realities that we live? Now, again, it's spaceless, but I'm I'm going I have a few arguments to describe. But before I do, let me describe and discuss our monetary architecture. Money, all its forms, is created through debt transactions whether you're talking about the cash in your hand, the deposit in your bank accounts, or what we call central bank reserves, which are what the banks keep with the central bank, they are all created through debt transactions. This is a chart from Bank England um, uh, Bulletin. It was an article published in the uh, Bank of England Quarterly, I believe. And it shows you that money is created at every step through loans, 
through debt transactions. Now, I'm not going to go into the technicalities of these transactions, the type of transactions are used, but you've heard about uh, the amount of money that was invested in, injected into the, the economies in the US, in the UK, in Europe, through quantitative easing or credit easing during the 2007 and 8 financial crisis, as well as during the pandemic. All those trillions that were put into the economy were put into the economy through the purchase of debt transactions. Now, debt-based money, which is our monetary architecture, uh, by the way, when I say debt-based money, it doesn't mean that people don't accumulate wealth. They create, they, they sell products, they add money deposits in their bank account, or they sell on the street or other cash products, and they keep, they have more cash. I'm talking about the creation of the currency of the money, the creation of deposits. How do they come to exist? And they all are created through debt transactions. Now, creating money through debt transactions has fundamental implications, systemic implications. And I'm going to discuss three of them here, one by one. But before I do, let me mention that cryptocurrencies aren't the answer. Cryptocurrencies don't solve any problem. They add rather than they reduce problems. Uh, instead of creating money, quote unquote money via debt, cryptocurrencies create crypto coins through mathematical guesswork. So they're not a sustainable uh, a replacement for the system we've got. Now, I just wanted to open that parenthesis. Now, what are the three systemic challenges and issues with debt-based money? The first one is calendar time. Let me explain what I mean. I'm sure you know by personal experience, any one of you has taken a credit card, a mortgage, a business loan, or whatever kind of loan, or um, or even invested in a bond, you know that all debt transactions have calendar time as a structural, core structural element of the instrument or the transaction. You have to pay months just and before. You have to pay the whole thing back five, 10 years from now, and so on and so forth. Calendar time is central to all money-creating instruments on planet Earth. Now, why is this an issue? Well, first of all, just a quick parenthesis. There are many different types of calendars. We've got the, um, the Gregorian calendar. We've got the uh, Hebrew calendar, Islamic calendar. They have different logics, but the, the world, uh, the the world of commerce, the world of finance, they uses the um, the uh, uh, the Gregorian calendar, which basically is based on the fact that a day is twenty four hours and a year is three hundred and sixty five. Actually, it's a bit more, but but what does what does this represent? Well, twenty four hours is one rotation of Earth around itself. And a year, which is 365 days, is the revolution of Earth around the sun. So one full circle on itself is a day, around the sun is a year. So this calendar is defined by the speed and the rotation of Earth around itself and around the sun. Now what is based on the world? Because how did you know now the logic here? But let me let, before I go into that, because calendar time moves at a very fixed pace. When we use calendar time as a core element of money creating instruments, we are the calendar time based obligations become a muzzle, and they prevent us from investing into space timelessly. So actually using calendar time as a foundational element of money creation 
acts as a muzzle on our ability to invest in space timelessly. Let me explain. Now I'm taking you back to the prime meridian, the grid that passes through Greenwich in the UK. And this is a beautiful quote, which I'd like to read, by, which is really phenomenal. The prime meridian is the line and the point at which the world's longitude is set at zero degrees. It does not exist in any strict material sense. Yet, through maps and clocks, the prime meridian governs the life of every human on Earth. You wouldn't have been able to get on this call, as I said, if it wasn't for the prime meridian. Because how would you know where your, how to, your, your clocks, your time, your computer, all this is, it's in this, it's already accounted for. Uh, but in reality, this projected grid and the time zones that you go through, because that's how you figure out whether it's 31st, um, it's the 18th of March or the 19th of March, right? The progression in the calendar is defined by the, the rotation and the turning of the grid. This implies that our entire monetary architecture how much we spend, how much can we, how is money created is linked and chained to Earth's speed, to the rotation on itself and revolution around the sun. Now I'm going to show you another video. This is an actual video from NASA. And if you watch the dates at the bottom, it shows the rotation of the planets. Not, so not the rotation, revolution. The rotations doesn't show, but that's you, you will you will be able to conclude that. Now imagine that our mon monetary structure, as Earth is uh, go, moving around the Sun and Mars, and we obviously a lot of us think that we should be going to Mars. So Mars has a very very different calendar, and imagine that our monetary capability is changed to how fast Earth is moving around the sun. But there are other celestial objects like Mars, like Jupiter, moving around the same sun at very different speeds. You see how it will be very hard to invest in space timelessly. Now, to take you, to give you a more numerical example, one day on Mars is 24.6 hours. One year on Mars is 687 days, Earth days. Do you see the difference? Now, NASA budgets, government debt limits, government fiscal position, these are defined on a yearly basis. The NASA budget is defined on a yearly basis, which, which is con dependent on um, the US uh, government debt, which is renewed if there is an increase in the debt limit and so on. And so I'll come back to this later on. Entire investment capability is chained to the calendar while other celestial objects where we intend to occupy move very differently and don't match our calendar. So using the calendar as a foundation of money creation is a muzzle on our invest on our ability to invest into outer space, and in fact, this is a very recent piece of news. Uh, March eleventh, NASA says spending caps force hard choices for its twenty twenty five budget. Do you see? Okay, so this is the first issue with debt based money. Now, this picture is fifty one years old, but in space, using money creating money based on calendar time, based on debt and calendar time, acts as a grid that, this is another AI generated image. As much as we would like to invest into space, our investment capability from a public perspective and also from, the, from a private perspective is linked to calendar time. And therefore it changes us, it changes us to the to the rotation and revolution of the planet. Now, the second issue with debt-based money is what I call monetary gravity. Now, what is monetary gravity? Monetary gravity, now, besides the fact that 
all debt transactions, private, public instruments, all of them include calendar time. All debt transactions also involve the requirement to repay, which means that there is a backward loop to the money creator. Even if you're paying interest electronically, right? It doesn't matter. You still have to make the payment on a monthly basis. What this implies that debt-based money, besides the calendar acting like a muzzle, debt-based money acts as a leash in space because we have to repay it to the creator of money, whether it's banks or central banks. And this phenomenon limits how far we can go in space before we have to return to some bank. And I can give you an example here using the basic speed formula. You don't have to understand the formula. The idea is that when you have to pay interest and principal in a month, there's only a certain distance that you can go in space before you have to return to the bank. Now, assuming a monthly interest on debt, and I've taken these examples to entertain you a bit, but also to show you that us and our greatest technologies will have a limit on how far they can go in space before returning to the bank when there is a calendar time obligation to do so. And the space, the actual limits in terms of meters, I give them below. Even light itself, if it has to go to the to return to the bank, there's only a certain distance it can go in space. You see, this is the second systemic issue. So again, in space, we are chained to a system because we have to repay that system. Now, the third issue with our monetary architecture, uh, that was also an AI-generated image. The third issue with our monetary architecture is what I call monetary hunger. Now, because money is cre continuously created by a debt, it's not something that happens and it stops. Every year, every month, money is created through debt. Even if there is immense amount of capital accumulation, even if some people are getting wealthy, it doesn't matter. Money is being created through debt. And the fact that it's being created through debt, that act creates monetary hunger in the system. Now, this is actual outstanding public and private debt in the US from 2000 to 2022 going from 28 trillion to 93 trillion. Because it has to, because it continuously creates money through debt. Now, when you take into account the threat of default, a large segment of society is chasing cash and deposits to pay calendar time-linked debt obligations. They have to. They will lose their home. They have to. They will lose their rating. Now, this is where when you consider the, the threat of default, this monetary system creates the hunger because you have to repay it and you're under the threat of default and in fact acts as a whip which most of the time triggers the unsustainable business practices by investors, businesses, households, because everyone prefers and chooses to serve their debts before the environment, before space, before anything else. So in space, we faced this, another AI-generated image for you. But this is only one side of the coin because this same structure is survive, it survives because of the uh, 
um, the uh, because governments, municipalities, agencies, organizations, corporations, businesses, households, individuals, they're all serving this system. Now, can you be surprised with the mess? Can we be surprised with the destruction of our ecosystem? When our financial value framework, our mathematics, our monetary system absolutely omit space and responsibility for impact on space? No. Now, we shouldn't also be surprised by the fact that the advertising industry and the toilet paper industry together are much bigger than the outer space industry. In fact, the outer space exploration sector, as I said, is 0.12% of global wealth, 0.52% of global GDP. Of course, when there's no space in our monetary system and our value framework and mathematics. Now, the private outer space sector, as much as it is promising, it is earthbound. It is earthbound. If you look at these sectors, consumer TV, consumer radio, ground equipment, uh, consumer broadband, earth observation services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even the billionaire funded projects, they make their cash with which they invest somewhere. Maybe it's an adjacent project. Or maybe it's Starlinks or another. It, the, the generation of funding from space cannot happen as of now. It happens because they have to sell their services on Earth. And this is why, because why? Because they're bound by the same risk time financial value framework and mathematics and must sell goods and services before any actual achievement in outer space or at least they should promise. So we are in space and we're chained to risk and time to the surface of the planet, another AI generated image for you. And we are so because of our financial value framework, because of our financial mathematics and because of our monetary architecture. Now you all potentially recognize this image this is the pale blue dot. Um, it was taken, sorry, I, the picture is a bit out of scope, out of uh, the, the screen. Uh, but this was taken by Voyager 1 in 1990, 6 billion kilometers away from Earth. And that's Earth. And Carl Sagan had a fantastic and beautiful quote about this image. Now, if we don't change trajectory, and if we don't do it now and immediately, I conjecture that there will be an alien astronomer, I called him Sal Kagan, will write something like this very soon. Look again at that dot. That's there, that's Earth. On it lived all those you will never meet and have never heard of. The species that ravaged its home its own home from under its own feet. In crafted confusion, they served imaginary debts and very real greed, failed to expand their reach and suffocated themselves to oblivion, suspended in a sunbeam. Now, what's the solution? At least what I propose as a solution. First, we have to introduce the dimension of space into finance. There is no way around it. No laws, no legal frameworks and sophisticated ESG or whatever's will save us unless we decide to transform the very discipline, the science, quote unquote, science that has allowed such uh, catastrophe to occur. It has absolved this type of treatment by its very theory, by its very framework, by its very mathematics. 
Now, again, just to remind you, space is defined as our physical context of matter, stretching a multi-layered reality, stretching from subatomic space to interstellar, interstellar space and every layer in between and beyond. Now, I argue that there is a missing principle in finance. If you recall, I mentioned the two principles that govern the current framework, time value of money and risk and return. We are missing a principle, which I call the space value of money. Now, the space value of money states something very basic. It says that a dollar invested in space must, at the very least, have a dollar's worth of positive impact on space. Now, I have, of course, I depict the logical, um, what does this principle do? And why is it important from, to start from responsibility of impact? because we have to take responsibility for impact. And the space value of money principle, it introduces to start off the respect for space. And that's what the principle achieves. Investors can pursue their returns, their risk-adjusted returns, their time-adjusted returns, but they cannot pursue those returns while they're having a negative impact on space. Now, once I introduce, once we introduce the principle, the space value of money principle, um, the new stakeholders of financial mathematics are not just the mortal risk averse return maximizing investor. And why do I call him mortal, him or her or uh, they? Mortal. Because risk and time are very mortal concerns. An immortal investor is not concerned with risk or time, or at least not as much. And by introducing the space value of money principle, we make planet and humanity integral stakeholders of our financial mathematics. And then I introduced the space value of money, the space value framework, where not only investors are not just measuring the risk and time value of their future cash flows and returns, but they are integrating and accounting for space impact. Do you see, if you remember at the initial, at the starting point, I, I, I mentioned that our financial mathematics, because it doesn't include space impact and because it doesn't have uh, because risk and return and time value of money discriminate against our evolutionary investment, space impact is irrelevant. So in other words, a project that is intends to mine an asteroid or a project that is going to make humanity multiplanetary, uh, a habitat on the moon, I mean, how are you going to finance uh, and build the structures and the research and the workforces and the manufacturing and maintain a habitat on the moon if the space impact that you're achieving isn't accounted for? So the space value framework allows the respect of space and the valuation of space and space impact. Now, I offer concepts, equations where uh, what I call the net and gross space value of investment, which account for the space impact of cash flows and integrate them into the value of investments, which, uh, uh, and I offer a series of investments, uh, equ excuse me, equations, which measure the pollution impact, the biodiversity impact, the human capital impact, R&D impact, net asset impact, net new, new money impact, and, and uh, they're in front of you. I'm not going to go into them. But just so quickly, these three equations, the pollution, biodiversity, and human capital impact, take care of that aspect that I started with. If you remember, I told you that why outer space and the pain on Earth isn't something we should focus on or the destruction of Earth. Of course we should. And the reason why 
we do it, as I told you, they are the two sides of the same coin, the same omission, theoretical and mathematical omission in finance. And these two equations, the R&D and the new asset impact will take care of this side. Now, I offer a lot more. I offer impact intensity measures that allow us to measure impacts. I offer what the concept of the space growth rate, which is something that should be used for every project. So you're not just discounting future cash flows, you're also compounding cash flows and investments into the future based on their space growth rate and their space impact. And then I offer alternative equations through which uh, all that uh, the space impact of cash flows can be integrated into uh, our equations. And I give examples. Now that doing all that will transform our financial value framework and our financial mathematics, but it will not transform money mechanics, otherwise the creation of money. As I described, as I told you earlier on, money is created through debt and the three major challenges it creates from um, the calendar time, monetary um, uh, gravity and monetary hunger. We need, we need to address those, not just change the framework and equations of investment. Now, how do we do that? First of all, let me assure you 100% so that you don't fall victim of any um, well-spoken, well-dressed um, uh, rhetoric about what is possible and what isn't possible. It is absolutely possible to transform how we create money, and it's a necessity. This is a quote from my 2020, uh, 22 book, um, and that's the balance sheet of the Bank of England. The, the, I'm gonna read the quote because to give you the, the, the sense. If the Bank of England can create and back banknotes by a deposit in the banking department of the Bank of England, if the Bank of England can create new money by lending to its own wholly owned subsidiary, if the Federal Reserve can create new money by buying toxic collateralized debt obligations and mortgage-backed securities or by buying commercial paper, there is no reason why they cannot back or create new money through an alternative equity-like instrument that shares risks, shares the ownership of the assets created through the instrument, has a tangible and inspiring positive space impact and helps resolve our evolutionary challenges. Now, I offer how and through what mechanism we can transform money creation. In fact, my proposition is very simple. I don't argue about tearing the system down uh, and so on and so forth. They're never useful, these things. Um, uh, and also uh, who's gonna rebuild it and how, and we have to improve what we have, always, always. Um, and um, to improve what we have, fundamentally improve, what we can do is we can introduce a new instrument for money creation, which isn't a debt instrument. So it addresses the previous challenges discussed. I offer the design of such an instrument, which I call public capitalization notes. And I offer the structure of a NASA PCN. Basically, this instrument will allow the setting of outer space priorities between public and private sectors, will mobilize the government treasury, will mobilize the Federal Reserve, and it can be under the leadership of NASA or any other viable institution who can manage this, and will create that massive drive of investment uh, that will allow us to transform our current uh, dynamic and achieve the type of investments we need to get to the point where we can build maintain, sustain, and expand a lunar habitat and a Mars habitat. 
Now I call this process value easing. I define the technical aspects as to how, what it means. And the reason I call it value easing because um, the central banks in the US, in UK, in Europe, around the world, they used what's called QE, which is quantitative easing to inject new money into the system in the pandemic, in the crisis before. And basically it amounted to buying uh, debt instruments from banks. So again, the money is given to the banks first and then how it ends up in your hands, my hand in any project, in any investment and what kind of investment is defined by more lending by banks. Value easing, which is based on the, like the NASA PCN example, will inject the money outside banks, which means it becomes income and expenditure first before it becomes eventually bank reserves. I'm not going to dig into the mechanics of it, but what I do want to open a final parenthesis here. If we do manage to transform money mechanics, and if we do introduce PCNs, uh, which are non-debt instruments with no maturity, high space value, then we will also be able to address another fundamental challenge of the world economy, the world financial system, which is the US national debt. Now, it could be higher and lower at this moment. This was taken a few days ago. That's 34 trillion and so on. Now, the US national debt and how much the US government, federal government can borrow is defined through what we call the debt ceiling or the debt limit, which is passed by Congress, uh, approved by the Senate, uh, and allows the federal government to borrow more. The limit is currently suspended until 2025 for obvious reasons, election and so on. But in 2023, where there was a brief crisis about to raise this limit or not and how, and there's always a big debate, even though everyone knows that that limit should be raised. But on a blog, on the White House, White House blog, at some point, the White House was warning everybody that um, new analyses by both the Congressional Budget Office and the U.S. Department of the Treasury suggest the United States is rapidly approaching the date at which the government can no longer pay its bills, also known as the X date. This is yet another reflection or, uh, of the systemic challenges of debt-based money. So if we were to transform and use PCNs for the space industry, for outer space exploration, for the transition to a, a, a healthier economy, we would also be able to gradually transform the US debt ceiling into a wealth floor. Now, I'm about to conclude. We need a new financial mathematics unavoidably, if we are going to be able to overcome the immense challenges we face on Earth and beyond Earth. And this process of introducing a new financial mathematics, it must introduce a dimension of space, our physical context, from subatomic to interstellar space, it must, it must introduce a principle of space value of money that establish respect. We must adjust our equations for space impact. We must adjust money creation based on space value creation so that we can fund the risky projects and the long horizon projects that are necessary to achieve any kind of meaningful uh, leap in outer space and also address many of the other evolutionary challenges we face. Now, let me conclude by saying that no amount of strikes, no amount of stop oil, no amount of protests will help change what we are faced with. And I mean this. Now, unless, of course, the protests are happening inside business schools, inside economics departments, because the bottleneck, the reason all this has been possible and is still possible is because of the discipline, 
which has legitimized this type of shortcoming in its theory, in its mathematics, and it's actually in the monetary architectures that it has given birth to. So the muzzle in space, the leash in space, the whip in space, the service in space, the chains of risk and time, the limitations of the monetary architecture, the abuse and relentless, ruthless consumption of the planet, they're all being absolved as of today by the theory and mathematics of finance and economics, which basically are being taught around the world. My last sentence, I'm going to read two small paragraphs from the Space Value of Money. We face the pressing need to transform money and finance, a discipline and industry that have sometimes unwittingly and sometimes intentionally damaged the very fabric of our ecosystem and thwarted the evolution of our species. Indeed, the root cause of our current predicament is not the carbon in our air, the plastic in our oceans, the rad radioactive waste on land, the sewage and garbage in our rivers, or the debris in orbit, but the lack of human responsibility, a monetary architecture that absolves it, and a discipline that has legitimized both. If we are to truly change course and secure the health of our home planet and the future of our children, we must reimagine the value of money and the institutional structures that create it. We face an evolutionary choice that will determine our survival and the sustainable expansion of human productivity on this planet and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much for this really, really great presentation. Uh, it was so interesting. And uh, yeah, I, I still keep with some questions. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky that you mentioned also the uh, environmental pollution and uh, how we are erupting our Earth. And um, yes. but um, you mentioned also that uh, laws don't play a role or forget about law. But I think we have to find rules for this. Uh, we have to make uh, companies responsible. If they send something into space that they have to bring it back. Also we had here a lot of uh, webinars about space debris and um, yes. we have also in our academy a group uh, um, dedicated to space debris. Yes. And um, I have another question. Um, I, I found it very interesting, the thought about uh, time and the calendar, and uh, I never thought about this uh, terminus. So it's uh, really great uh, to have a new idea about this. But as far as I know, and tell me if I'm wrong, but um, as far as I know, the money here on Earth is covered with gold. Is it right or not? So if banks or, or uh, the states have uh, uh, their gold, uh, gold, um, no, no, no. and uh, and because I, I was thinking they are think uh, uh, thinking about to uh, exploit asteroids and uh, even moon and uh, other planets to to get some um, resources, uh, gold or other. Um, materials, uh, raw materials, uh, what they can get. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure if it is necessary to transform our monetary system, because if people really will settle on Mars, I think it is hundreds of years away, but or in an other, other space habitat, uh, then they will have their own monetary system and um, Oh, I'm wrong. <laughs> well, uh, I just argued for a change because to get to Mars, uh, we need to make the investments. To get to the moon, we need to do the investments. Uh, to grow the sector, 
we need to do the investments. And government budgets are dependent on government debts. Uh, and the monetary system, when cha it chains everyone to calendar time, it chains businesses to calendar time. It chains us to an imaginary concept on the surface of the planet and our monetary structure along with it. So absolutely necessary, absolutely necessary. Mo the Mars can have a, its own monetary system, but before you get there and before we create such, a, and if it was ever necessary even, uh, but fundamentally, we won't be able to break these chains uh, without the transformation. In fact, without changing our monetary architecture, we will not address the utter and complete destruction of the planet. We will yes, not. Yes, we, yes, will not. Right. Mm -hmm. we will not. And it will and we will ride it to the oblivion. Um, and it's not just about carbon, the plastic, the chemical waste, the debris, it's everywhere. It's every, the entire human productivity is triggered and driven by these by the hunger because they have to pay their debts and they have to pay their debts before and more most importantly before anything else because that's how the system is built because emission reporting is still voluntary. Try to make your debt payments voluntary and come back and tell me. <laughs> I luckily have no debts. So. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm not talking individually. I'm talking about. Yeah, yes, I, I, I know. You know but I was thinking Ch China has, has no debts. And um, I think China uh, has a good economy. Uh, and. Uh, or not? Okay. Uh, I take questions from um, from the chat. Oh God, Anna Larsen is writing here a lot. Um, Thorsten Frank is asking, uh, what is your opinion on Tobin tax? Um, well, tax is a, also all kinds of taxes. Um, they reflect, first of all, in our current system, the fact that governments are also a uh, part of this system. Governments are also in debt, right? Uh, governments also pay, raise money through debt and taxes, yes, but there is a, there's an entire architecture that funds expenditure through government debt. So taxing is, uh, I'm not a big fan of taxes, honestly. Uh, because we 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 have a fundamental issue with our monetary architecture, we have a fundamental issue with our frameworks, with our equations. Uh, taxing, why the, we have to fix the more fundamental issues first before we start raising taxes. And and by the way, um, there are important elections I know going on in the U.S. and the U.K. Different sides promising different things will not change the fact that the debt limit will have to be raised. Promising images or visions of, a, of, of new public services or other, they will not be, the, unless there is a fundamental change in the monetary architecture with which these efforts are being funded, neither, no, no side will be able to deliver what they're promising. Because we've reached a point on a planetary level uh, where these transformations have become existential issues. So that's my answer. Uh, here's an, thank you. Here's another question from Mikhail Basko. Um, if you assume almost unlimited value of return, capturing many huge asteroids of gold, titanium, zirconium, uh, and so on wouldn't um, wouldn't that make financial sense even it um, takes many space years? So I, I didn't catch that. Can you repeat it? Sorry. It's just a second. Also, um, moment. Where's the question here? If you assume uh, almost unlimited value of return. 
and uh, into parentheses, capturing um, um, into brackets, uh, capturing many huge asteroids of gold, titanium, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't that make financial sense, even um, if it takes many space years? Yes, of course. But yeah. uh, capturing an asteroid, um, uh, mining an asteroid, uh, and all those um, fundamental um, huge achievements um, before we get to the point of monetizing that space value, uh, they require us to value that beyond just cash flows to make the investments because the timelines are very distant. So, yes, very relevant, very, very important, uh, because as we expand above out of the planet, whether we're on the moon, um, and once we master um, two types of physics, Earth physics and moon physics, because obviously gravitationally, there's many different things that have to change. Uh, once we have a factory on the moon, uh, when and if we're building starships on the moon, they're very different from starships on the Earth uh, for many different reasons, right? Um, calculations regarding what we need uh, to go to, they, they're all different. So, uh, so, so in that sense, yes, absolutely necessary. Um, to invaluable, but before we get to that point, we must start valuing a footprint to be able to create value where we stand, not just in terms of risk and time. And here's another question from Daniel Tweb. Um, earlier, um, you forgot that crypto allows uh, for peer-to-peer -peer instant value transfers not requiring a third party. I so didn't forget. I didn't forget that. The issue with crypto isn't the fact that it has, um, you know, no intermediation or because it competes with banks. That's not the issue. The crypto has a fundamental challenge. Let's take the example of Bitcoin. First of all, the no amount is limited, one. Second, the, of course, you've got energy consumption, you've got volatility, you've got the fact that it's considered dark money, you've got, uh, there are many aspects, but the most important issue with cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, and you can check this on the webs, on their own webs, on some of the key uh, websites which talk and explain Bitcoin, the major ones. You'll realize that Miners, when they earn a Bitcoin, the mining process involves a process of mathematical guesswork, proof of work or whatever. You have to be able to, that's why so much computing power is required. That's why there is an immense electronic waste footprint. Because the creation and the awarding of Bitcoins involves mathematical guesswork with powerful computers. So basically we're moving from debt logic to mathematical guesswork logic. And crypto doesn't address the fact that space is still missing. We have to introduce money creation based on space value creation. Until we reach that point of monetary evolution, we will be the victims of the risk and time framework. And of course, Crypto doesn't address that, even if it addresses the fact that you're going around banks. But that in itself doesn't provide a tool with which you can uh, create the value that we need uh, on a multi-planetary landscape. Um, someone was asking, um, Gary Gilbert, um, how can we send you emails uh, and ask about stuff in more detail? Is it possible to put your absolutely, absolutely? You can email contact in me. the chat. <clears throat> uh, you can, you can, uh, you first the be the safest way and the easiest way is to go to the Space Value Foundation website uh, and use the info at spacevalue.com email account, and uh, I will. We can then communicate, get in touch. They will. It will be forwarded to me, and I will uh, I can pick it up, and we can continue the discussion offline. 
And Nick Nielsen is asking, does this speaker, so does you see any difference between the financial resources necessary to establish space settlements and the financial resources necessary to further outward exploration? Yeah, I mean, it's they're very linked because eventually the one is a step for the other. I mean, we have to be able to... Uh, I, I mean, I think if we are going to really stretch our reach, expand our reach. Um, I think we have to realize that it's going to be in stages. And there's going to just the way you, when you go into a new continent, you, you you establish a first colony, first base, first of which you, from there you expand. The same logic with which we've uh, discovered and con quote unquote conquered the continents of on earth um, we will do if, if the logic will remain. So, so Moon is a step, uh, Earth, Mars is a step, and so everything is uh, can be expanded. Um, I think they're interlinked. Yes. And um, there's another remark from from Ina Larsen. Um, um, are you using AI art for sustainability? Uh, if you had approached artists with really with real intelligence, you would have been supported by real artists with uh, your presentation. So he was claiming that you are using or complaining uh, that you are using AI uh, art. Um, and if you find it a sustainable um so so sorry the fact is that i've used ai to generate images is that what yes. it is yes yes well, well well i used the ai um tool to give color to some of the concepts and to make the presentation more entertaining um especially that there was going to be a lot of um, mathematical financial concepts so i try to give it uh, make it more entertaining um but AI, I mean, has it's a whole big subject, um, and also what kind of AI, whether we're talking natural language processing, language models, large language models, uh, or image generators, and or artificial general intelligence. It, I mean, it's a huge subject. So um, I used it to to give it some more color. Uh, so that's where I'll I'll. That's my reply. I explain it a little bit. I, I know in the internet there is a big. Uh discussion uh, i'm an artist too and i have seen really images uh, ai and uh, generated images and uh, some artists were posting their original artwork and uh, what ai generated uh, for other people and they have used or stolen their artwork and uh, i know that um so yeah i mean i i, I respect the concern mm. because because um but you have to, I think we have to realize something. And yes, I mean, um, um, the image, gener the, the, the machine learning process that is, uh, that backs, that is the key um, to, to these models is being fed these images, which out of which it's be new images are being created. And definitely there are privacy issues. Um, so yes, um, I respect the concern. Um, but there are also many other aspects of AI. Uh, AI has its own risks. AI also isn't, uh, most of the time, it isn't what, um, I'm not talking about images. I'm not talking about art. Only. I mean, I, that is fully something I respect. Um, so um, if I've used, if the AI generated images used uh, any images from artists, uh, my uh, heartfelt apologies on behalf of the AI tools I've used. Um, but in general, AI is something that um, at the moment uh, it, it has a, a, an asymptotic intelligence. And in other words, because its intelligence is based on what it's being fed, which is what we write, what we draw, what it's so on and so forth. Um, and if you read what humans write, um, you know, and, and how the systems work at the moment, um, I think as much as there are many concerns and valid concerns about these tools and how they can be used for 
um, unlawful or um, uh, unhealthy uh, uh, <clears throat> targets. The fact remains that as a non-painter, non-artist, I love the fact that I could conceptualize some of these concepts with prompts. You see, it also depends whether the machine is using you as an input or use, you're using the machine for an output. An artist is the input of the image generator. The non-artist is the user of the... So, yes, I respect the concern. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, Adriano, uh, do, I see you have some questions too. <laughs> I, I give you the word, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, too many, too many. So I, I Yes, it was so much, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there, there would be also many things to say about artificial intelligence, but this is not the topic of today. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. Exactly. I, exactly believe, yeah. I think the topic of today is big enough and we don't yes, need yes. to import <laughs> other things. Agreed. Yeah. But I didn't want to uh, ignore this oh, comment yeah. because he wrote it several no, times in the I'm, chat. I mean, and then... I, I'm not criticizing you. I, 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 it was interesting what you said, however. Yes. But uh, yeah, I, I would have so many things to because uh, this uh, terrific presentation really put a lot of things on the table that is difficult to but i will just uh, uh, say what uh, came up to my mind because of course i am not an economist and i'm uh, i even and uh, uh, I'm, I'm not able to follow all the scientific part of your presentation but however i tried to understand the uh, let me say the the common sense part that we can understand and uh, the, the, the practical, uh, to try to earn some practical, uh, pragmatic uh, teachings mm -hmm. yes. from what you said. And there are two big uh, questions that came to my, to my mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is considering that the currency during the, the millennia passed from solid things like stones to metals to precious metals like gold gold, uh, gold and silver and uh, then uh, uh, to less precious uh, metals like iron or other uh, things and then to to paper banknotes and finally to immaterial that is the electronic money I mean, not only the, the cryptocurrency, but the, uh, the, the credit cards and all the electronic movements, no transactions and so on. So my question is, my first question, when people say today, there are no money, what does it mean? I can understand what it, what it, it was meaning many years ago when money were pieces, no? Uh, there are no money, there is no gold. Okay, it's easy to understand. There are no money, there are no bank notes. At least bit, uh, a bit less uh, easy to understand because bank, bank notes doesn't have the same value of a gold and uh, um, uh, money. Mm -hmm. uh, bank notes can be printed and the value of each uh, sheet of paper is very much less than the, what is written on, on, on the paper. So, mm -hmm. okay. But now that money are bits in some big server, mm -hmm. what does it mean there is no money? There what? is no, but it, uh, it means uh, there is not enough power uh, energy to, to make supercomputers to work. No, I don't think so. No, uh, no, no. I mean, first of all, I, you... I, I believe. I, I, I give you my, uh, then I, I, I give you the question, but I also give you my, uh, my answer. Mm -hmm. It means uh, uh, if there is no money, it means there is no maturity in the, in the, in the governance. Because mature, if we had more maturity in the governance, we would understand what are the very worst social problems. So we will direct this energy, you know, the electronic money, we will direct where the money are needed you know, to solve the environmental problems, uh, to, uh, to develop space. You know? 
to de- to to make civilian space development because we need it. Mm-hmm. We are eight billion, you said several times in your presentation. So we need it. Yeah. So okay, but I I I also go back, step back to the technical question. What does it mean? There are no money today. When people say there is a crisis, there are no money. Okay. When first of all, who is saying that matters. Okay, if it's the government saying it is one thing. If it's a corporation, if it's a, uh, it depends who is saying first. That's my first response question. But assuming we're talking yeah, about sorry, government, so, sorry, sorry, yes, government say it every day. Yeah, there is no money. They took, they take money to the poor people to finance something else. They they take money from the sanity, the health system, to to finance uh, the uh, military expenditure. No, mm-hmm. the weapon expenditure and so on. So the you, you know the the cover is short. If you pull it from one side, it uncover the. Uh, if you pull it on on your head, it uncover your feet and and vice versa. No, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but we we listen to it yeah. every day. Okay. No, no, no. I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, the logic, the explanation rests in the fact that um, when governments are going to spend, right, and when they're going to spend a certain amount of money, they are either earning that through taxes, right, uh, or if they have any other public services that they charge, and the rest is borrowed. That's why there's always a big deficit issue or debate. And that's why the uh, um, debts keep rising and so on. But the issue is that the reason that is the case is because governments are not actually the, um, they are in the same exact position as you as an individual or a uh, Uh, or a corporation in the sense that they are also borrowing. They're not the lender, right? Mm -hmm. So the lender is the creator of money. Yeah. Central bank and banks. Now, the creators of money, and this is, I mean, your question is actually very important because what governs Because, as I told you, money is created through debt transactions. Yeah. If there is no or there are no eligible borrowers, it's very hard to create new money. That's why at different points of crisis, the central bank, I mean, look at what the the Bank of England did in the pandemic and in the 2007 and 8 crisis. They created a 100% Bank of England-owned company. Hmm? They lent it money. Look at that, right? And that that company went into the market and bought bonds and instruments, toxic instruments, from the banks. So they added new digits into the accounts of the banks. But the the issue is that the banks, in order to, they have to lend more, make new loans for that money to reach the actual economy. And the priorities of banks are defined within the same risk and time framework. You see? Money has to risk the, the timeline of cash flows, the riskiness of cash flows. That's how they make the decisions. We are this machine that 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 um, that doesn't have, as they say, it's a it's a it's it's untrue. It's it's a it's just that how it is created, where it is created, where is it injected? They, these are fundamental questions. I actually discussed them at the, quite a depth in both books, both books actually, um, and I discussed the fact that this the. Um, Uh, How did the governments and the central banks create trillions when the pandemic arrived? Of course, it's possible. It's created through debt. It's all about the type of um, uh, instruments and agreements that you create to facilitate the creation and the logic you allow. So 
that's my short. Otherwise, it will take quite a bit long. But that's my very uh, shortened uh, response. So, uh, but it's it's not true. You can invent money through debt transactions, but you need to have the eligible borrowers. And in the central bank case, as I told you, the Bank of England created a hundred percent own subsidiary, lent it money. And then that company went and bought trans instruments from the banks to get them to, to alleviate their pressure, uh, support their balance sheet, and remove the toxic instruments in the 2007 and 8 crisis from their balance sheet. It's so all you, possible. You are describing a, a system that was maybe created many years ago when the money was, uh, was material. And no, now no, it survives. It doesn't, it doesn't, and, and no, now no, it no. survives. It, it now is a muzzle. You say it is a muzzle. This system, no, because it's it is surviving. It is surviving to the new technologies and is uh, somehow. Uh, it's not uh, about the technology. It's not about the technology. It's about the logic of creation. First of all, deposit. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah. The, the Deposits, deposits, which you have at banks, which are they're not necessarily cash, right? They you take out. They, they become cash when you take the cash out of banks, but in the, themselves, deposits are digits in your bank account currently electronically, previously in, on paper, but they're records, right? Yes. They are created into existence through debt transactions. When you, when you borrow a certain amount from a bank, you once you sign the contract, the moment you sign the contract, the bank enters the digits in your account. Then you use those digits to buy electronically, or if it's paper, it's paper. The technology, the medium, doesn't matter. As I told you, at some point, money no, used no. to be... Yeah, I, I, that's what I meant. I have meant. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, and, okay, coming... Uh, so this was the senior age, no? The, the, the system was the senior age of the money, no? The, the, the money creators. Yes, but that's not what it is. Senior is a bit different, but yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, you know, though, okay. but it is a part of, of, of all this. My yeah. second uh, uh, thought uh, yes, of course, all of our economy is based on debt and repay. And in the middle, what is what is it, it exists in the middle? Uh, the trust and the confidence. Mm -hmm. that the debt will be repaid mm -hmm. and possibly give a profit because if i if i invest my money i i i make a, a i give you my money and you will give me more than what i gave you because it's the logic of the investment mm -hmm. right okay so in the middle the confidence that is a psychological uh, condition is what it determines the uh, uh, the bull or 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 the the beer in, in the economics the the growth of the economy or the crisis the the, uh, the, the, the it's the, a bit the, different Adriano oh, because the oh, bull and the bear they're market sentiments they don't necessarily yeah the, the sentiment game. exactly so what I want to to say is that. Uh, the uh, the system, the economic system, mm -hmm. look like looks like uh, some kind of uh, natural system, no? That uh, works uh, on on the basis of uh, sentiment of, of the people, prevailing sentiment. But it works uh, like the natural works, killing the weaks and prizing the strongest and the, and the strong the most arrogant i'm uh, not sure so i'm not sure i really that you don't see it like that no uh, okay it's, it's an, it, i think it maybe is a naive view of uh, uh, of the economy but no, however I, uh, I think my my idea was that we should maybe try to uh, at least in the such okay it's worth to copy nature in many other things you know, if we want to develop better systems flying systems mm -hmm. uh, 
cop trying to understand how nature flies mm -hmm. it, it's a good thing mm -hmm. but i i always told that it is not good to copy nature for social uh, engineering because uh, uh, you know nature is cruel nature is uh, doesn't know pity and in our complex society uh, often the weakest people the less arrogant have very good brains and should deserve to be somehow prized and, and supported and helped. Mm -hmm. And our economy doesn't do that. Our economy kills the weak people and prizes the most uh, strong and arrogant that uh, say, okay, this is mine. So, no. But I'm not sure I agree because I think. Um... That's a belief you should reconsider because I think first it's not about weak and arrogant or um, I think it's think about it this way. Um, if you are actually creating something of value and in the current framework, where risk and time, right? Again, I'm I'm describing in the current context because I see what, what your main point is, but I wouldn't, it's not about rewarding the arrogant or I don't think that's the way it works. It's, it's that it rewards those who operate and offer value within the current risk and time framework. If you're offering value in the current system, when space impact uh, isn't relevant in the equations, in its own right, unless you are contributing to a process that will make more money, the system cannot actually value you as relevant. And when it values based on risk and time, Relevant why, why is it going to give you more value? That's why even Elon Musk and Bezos and all the others, their value comes, their, SpaceX has to launch Starlinks and, and, and so on and so forth. The, the adjacent cash flows is where the, the value is being put in. In space, there is no, and even the money that is made is made by either government subsidies or by selling services on earth value for itself the space impact the footprint itself is not yet valued in our frame so in in the example you were gave, giving it's not about weak or arrogant no it's about the fact that if your value your your intelligence or your is not contributing to a risk and time adjusted money making process you're going to have challenges because the system values only risk and time adjusted returns. And yeah, no, otherwise okay. it's a big discussion, uh, but no, that's, no, that would be my I response. Follow, no, I follow you and I, I agree with you perfectly when you talk about Elon Musk and, and uh, Jeff Bezos. I don't think they are uh, that kind of arrogant uh, entrepreneur. Exactly, uh, yes. Yeah. They, they are... I think they are benefactor of humanity, by the way. Yes, Whatever yes. they pos their position, I think that Elon Musk is saying is writing horrible things about immigration, and uh, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I just uh, uh, prize Elon Musk for what he's doing. That mm -hmm. is great, and nobody mm -hmm. else. Uh, uh, I think if it was not for Elon Musk, we 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 had no no hope as a as a yes, as a but he has an illusion. So, he has an illusion, but uh, oh. and and but I think he's. Only only no, only so one just, one sentence. I, I had to I had to ask something. But no, no, I I wanted to add something to your to your sentence. But Elon Musk uh, is a businessman, and he will not do anything uh, yeah, to not get money. Me. So did I wanted to add? Hmm? Uh, sorry, but uh, the, sorry. The, the natural question now, the logical question near to this consideration about Musk and Bezos uh, is what kind of value are the warmongers 
bring into humanity now because they want to sell weapons systems and they uh, they try to put fuel on the on the fires and there are fires on on, on earth right now okay so, i I mean... but, but the, the economic system seems to be pricing the weapon and and we uh, we had the two trillions per year spent in in, in military uh, expenditure and I think this year they, there will be maybe three trillions because they uh, everywhere is they are increasing the military expenditure mm -hmm. so what where is the value in this this is only a profit value and there is no social value in that. Oh, well, let me let me just say two things, and, and maybe we can make this the last question because I realize it's already. I, I maybe I dragged the time, so uh, we said nine thirty, but it's ten. Oh yes, we are. We have so, to. Yes, but, but it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Very much longer than normally. <laughs> yes, and and, and yeah, Sorry. maybe I I took a bit more time, but let me let me just answer that because I think given the current, the many current crises we're facing, conflicts and so on. Yes, there are uh, weapons manufacturers that have their share price uh, quoted on public stock exchanges. I mean, imagine the stock price will go up when they make more profit. They will make more profit if they sell more weapons. So it, there is actually, it's like a, it's a giant coliseum. We're watching uh, as to when the, the same, but that's, that's only a half of the story though. Uh, one of the key issues that I, I think it's very important to, to identify, uh, the map, uh, I don't, the reason I don't like identifying people, uh, um, and that's why I'm not comfortable with the, 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 lab, the, the, the word you used, warmongers, and, because I don't think, um, and this is one of the reasons why there are so many, conf so many, the conflicts uh, on, on the surface of Earth, uh, because we identify the problem with humans. The problem is always in imagination. The problem is always in thought. Um, the problem, um, John Maynard Keynes has a beautiful quote, which I actually have in the presentation. I didn't get to that, but I didn't find it. It's actually at the end of the paper uh, that he describes and he says that um, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and they are wrong, are more powerful than people realize. In fact, the world is run by little else. Um, leaders, uh, uh, governmental, uh, police politicians and, uh, and other, they think they're, they're arguing something, but the, the entire... Um, the the background, the scientific base, the assumptions, the education, and the uh, projections—they're all founded on on the level of understanding, uh, on the science, on the projections that we make, on the imaginative universe that we occupy, and the structures are the outcome of. Um, we have to change the way we understand and the way we perceive things. As such, it's not about specific people. It's never about specific people. The 8 billion, some of them are doing this. Yes, some of them can cause a lot of trouble to people around them. Some could be in conflict uh, um, and so on and so forth. That's true. And they can cause pain and they can cause destruction. But ultimately, uh, the transformations, the evolution um, happens on the level of interpretation on the level of mind. Um, and, and that's where the debate should focus because that's how we we can transform our markets. Um, if we introduce the space value of money principle, let's say, it's yeah, actually, in my your, opinion, in my opinion, the main proposal. it's the only I way, think. it's the only way to transform the current capitalist um, uh, situation. And I say situation because I've got nothing against capitalism per se uh, because everything is an idea at the end of the day mismanaged idea i'm not against it's, capitalism i'm not you know it's not about cap yeah, exactly what i'm trying to say it's, it's, it's not exactly. it's not about capitalism we have what we have 
Uh, mm -hmm. We have to improve the way we are applying the tools we have. Uh, and I believe the space value of money is that which will allow our investments, our markets, our stock markets, our budgets, uh, our debt limits to transform into the type of markets and systems that can address evolutionary challenges and stop causing them. We don't mm -hmm. have that type of a framework. So, as okay. Oh, so, yeah. so you, you yeah. think that introducing the space value inside the economical uh, science, let me say, will make uh, people understand that there is more value in, in, in developing space than developing uh, conflicts on Earth, to say it in more a, very, more, in a yes. very naive and simple way. Yeah, well, no? yeah, well, yes, because until you have a principle of value, and not just outer space, yeah, space on value, Earth, yeah. we're not valuing any level of space. We're creating nanotoxins yeah. in the in, in the nano level. We're, we're dumping uh, microplastics in our food chain, in the ocean, on land, in the air, on the everywhere. Because we've got this confused relationship with our physical context of matter. Because we're serving these calendar-based payments, thinking that that's the reality we are living in. The stars mm -hmm. are not just above, they're underneath our feet as well. The moment the mind forgets where it is and it gets absorbed into misinterpretations, uh, the map is an interpretation, but it's a yes, it may be very real for some people, um, but it could be very important for some people on a map. But there are other people who don't care about the map, but they care about a very holy book more than the map. Uh, some people have different holy books than others. They don't care about the map. They care about the book. The, that 8 billion mm -hmm. uh, is a mosaic of interpretations. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that mosaic, yes, there are elements of, of, of conflict and we try to impose interpretations on each other. We misinterpret. We, uh, we forget the stars beneath and above, etc. But bottom line, the way we are mistreating the entire spectrum of space and that's why if the moment we have we come to that realization we can we can also stop the relentless consumption of our only hope from underneath our own feet because before we get to outer space before this has to this this the way we are consuming our own space is it has to do with the monetary structures it has to do with our monetary financial value framework it has to do with our equations because that's what is being taught in every classroom and that's what is being passed on. And, 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 it, 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 and the only way to stop it is to change the interpretation instead of fighting capital, instead of fighting those people. It's, it's never about a specific group of people. It's always about the landscape of interpretation and the dominant interpretations we, that are governing uh, our, our life on the planet. Mm. Okay, I have I have one last question from the chat. Um, it's from Ina Larsen from Norway, and he is uh, asking, <clears throat> do you think an intelligent civiliza civilization um, capable of uh, traveling between solar systems uh, uses monetary systems? Who knows? Well, as I started in the beginning, I... I presented all this given the fact that we are a species in space that uses money and monetary incentives. If oh, yeah. we, it, and I, that was my first sentence. Because there is, it is possible to imagine a species in space that hasn't fallen victim to such a system. It is possible. Some humans, other humans, other economists, other financial analysts may say, oh, it's impossible. Maybe, maybe not for us. But in the universe, it is possible that a, a species finds another alternative way of incentivizing its own creativity and productivity without going through a monetary intermediation. But given the fact that we do, how we do it matters. And the principles, the framework, the mathematics, and the architecture 
with which we create it, deploy it, invest it, is fundamental to the way we are ravaging our planet and undermining ourselves in the solar system, in the galaxy, not investing in our, our, in, in our expansion uh, because of artificial constructs like calendar and, uh, and, and, and the calendar-based money and, and debt-based money and um, spaceless equations. And that is first, we don't change that value framework. It doesn't matter how much we argue or who we argue with or how we, um, or if we find um, the, uh, specific people responsible for specific um, damaging investment. That's not the issue. The issue isn't the fact that there's one single business that is doing, um, let's say, uh, emissions, right? You can have a, a, a genetic um, the engineering firm that is um, that is running on solar power, but is creating nanotoxins all over the place, um, etc. I mean, I'm just giving you an example, right? So it we have to recognize on our monetary financial framework level that space and its many layers is where we are, and how we treat it, it, if it's not integrated into this money and monetary incentive architecture, this is what happens. So in a way, money isn't necessary for expansion across the galaxy, for maybe for in a priori, but for us, given how where we are and how we've structured our own productivity on Earth, if we are, if, if, they, if we've it is then these is, these principles and this these equations are necessary so we can integrate space impact as part of our um, uh, equations and therefore allow investments to go to them. So that's it. Amen. I thank you so very much thank for you. being so thank patient you. with us, for answering all thank these you. questions and uh, for it's your excellent lecture. It was really, really a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, I hope you. we can have you again. And uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, it was really, really, really very interesting. And uh, I enjoyed uh, your lecture a lot. Thank you for organizing. Thank you, Adriano. Thank you to thank SRI, you. SRA. Uh, for all uh, the organization for inviting and uh, and all the audience for listening uh, as yes. well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And, Thank you very uh, much. Thank and you. I, I would like also before we leave, I would like uh, to tell our audience uh, what's the outlook for uh, the 8th of April. Uh, we will have Lugina Ferretti and um, she will give a talk about astrophysics for dummies. So if you like, uh, Adriano will put uh, um, email in the chat, his email, and collect some questions and forehand. Uh, she will give um, yeah, a basic overview about astronomy, or you can ask questions about astronomy you wanted to, to ask always. And uh, yeah, you can send these questions uh, to Adriano, and uh, he will forward it uh, to um, Lugina, yes. and uh, she will make a, a nice presentation out of that. And uh, as always, you know, we are a volunteer-based uh, organization and we always need your support. So please join us. Uh, also, uh, you are invited, I mean, to become a member of Space Renaissance International. Yes, <laughs> and uh, we, we could do with an uh, economist. <laughs> we need a chief financial officer. No. Yes, correct. Yeah. And uh, thank you again for being with us and uh, this thank interesting you. lecture. And uh, to welcome. our audience, thank you for joining us all this time. Um, it was longer than usual, but it means uh, it was so interesting. So Good. thank you, and I wish you all a nice evening and hope thank to you. see you on uh, the 8th of April. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.